My daughter Dana fought a long battle with Crohn's disease before passing last year. Max has spent a lifetime scoring goals. It's our goal to help the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation find a cure for this horrible disease so no one else's child has to suffer like Dana did. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis may be unfamiliar to you, but there are currently over 3 million Americans suffering from both. Join Max and I in scoring our goal to find a cure. If you have a sore knee, bad hip, some other miscellaneous issues, want some advice, this is the place to be. With me is Dr. Matt Otten, who's an orthopedic surgeon in town and specializes in stem cells and, um, and PRP. And regenerative orthopedics is now what we're beginning to call it actually these days because it's actually finding a name and a place in medicine. Right. I mean, you hear so much about PRP and stem cell. What is the the fundamental difference between the two. Sure. Yeah. So regenerative orthopedics and regenerative medicine in general is because it's the science of taking something from your own self and placing it or concentrating it and placing it somewhere where there's an injury to help heal an old chronic or an acute, meaning a new injury. So PRP was how this field of medicine actually started. Mm -hmm. And PRP came around about 25 years ago. Stands for? Uh, Platelet-rich plasma yeah. therapy. Sorry, I talk about it all <laughs> yeah. day long, so correct me anytime. Well, no, no, because yeah. it's known as PRP, and I think most of our audience doesn't really understand what, it, what, it, what, what, where the, what the words mean. Absolutely. Yeah. So PRP, or platelet-rich plasma therapy, began about 20 years ago on professional athletes. And then it kind of began to trickle down into the common, uh, common public, and the common public started realizing how effective this was for their ailments, whether it be arthritic or, or old injuries, as well as new and acute injuries in healing and improving pain and function. So that was around 25 years ago. And about 10 to 15 years ago, then we started to start utilizing stem cells from patients' body, whether it be from the adipose tissue or the fat or the bone marrow. And we started transplanting stem cells into locations of injury, whether it be arthritis or torn meniscuses or torn tendons or torn muscles to heal these injuries. So really we've been using these for orthopedic medicine for the last 10 to 15 years in the United States on a regular basis opposed to a stem cell is different than a PRP. That's correct. So there's, you're kind of comparing apples to oranges with this. So PRP is taking your blood, concentrating your platelets, and injecting concentrated platelets into a certain location. Platelets are the body's first line of defense in an injury, and they initiate the healing response. They actually help call in stem cells. Whereas stem cell transplantation and stem cell therapies is harvesting stem cells, concentrating stem cells, and injecting those stem cells into a location of injury. Stem cells are the actual cells that can differentiate, and that's a word that I can explain in a sec, that will differentiate into specific cells to regenerate tissue. So differentiate means, so a stem cell that we utilize from the body is actually called a pluripotent stem cell. And in orthopedic and spine medicine, we're looking for something called a mesenchymal stem cell. Mesenchymal stem cells can turn into a couple different things because they're pluripotent. They can turn into cartilage, muscle, tendon, ligaments, nerves, and, car and uh, bone. Those are the main things that they'll turn into. So it, it, it kind of grows within your body, for lack of a better way of describing this? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. So what we do is we, so take for a knee, because a knee is a very mm -hmm. common thing that we deal with on a daily basis. So if you, jack, if you inject mesenchymal stem cells into a knee, they'll simply look around and search out areas of injuries and latch on. And the way that I typically describe them is literally octopuses. And if you'd like, I can show you pictures and I can link them to your website if you like too. They literally branch 
reach out and have little legs and they latch on to areas of injury and differentiate into that particular cell. So let's use cartilage for an example. So if, if a stem cell is injected into the knee, they can find an area of thinned or damaged cartilage, they'll latch on with their little legs and they'll stay there for about a year. And underneath those little legs, they'll actually regenerate cartilage. It's unbelievable and because you know when you talk about like so many of us have problems in our joints and through arthritis and just um, overuse, misuse, that type of thing, accidents. And, and typically you have this layer of cartilage um, between bone, right? That's correct. So, and then when you develop arthritis or have an injury, you lose that layer of cartilage and you kind of got bone rubbing against bone, right? That's correct. So you're able to, um, th there has to be, I guess, I assume, some remaining cartilage there that can be um, re, uh, what's the word? Uh, regrown. <laughs> regrown, thank you. Um, um, you know, after, from a stem cell injection? That's true, so and, and because, it, so yes, the answer is yes. You can actually regrow cartilage. Um, it does help if there's a little cartilage there, but it also will latch onto bone, exposed bone as well. And that's a full exposure of bone, or what we call a grade four chondromalacia in medicine. Um, there's really good studies where we've utilized high Tesla MRIs, which are very, very um, powerful magnet to get beautiful mm -hmm. pictures of the cartilage on an MRI. And we followed these patients throughout the course of about 12 to 18 months, watching their cartilage, seeing how the density of the cartilage changes, and seeing how the thickness of the cartilage changes. And what we've been able to document in multiple different studies along the way now is significant improvement in density and thickness of cartilage. Now the articular cartilage is something very important. Our body is lined with cartilage in all of our articular joints. Articular joints are the joints that move. So it's the knees, it's the ankles, it's the hips, it's the shoulders. It's any joint that needs to glide smoothly, including the back. There's facet joints lined with articular cartilage. And the best way to describe articular cartilage is basically it's a sheet of ice on top of concrete. If the concrete is the bone and there's a thin sheet of ice, it makes that joint glide. Just like if you, if you drive over a sheet of ice, you're going to slide and slip. That's what you want with the joint. And over time, just if we drive over that sheet of ice over a course of time, it begins to wear it down and develops potholes. It's the exact same analogy in the human body. The more we use it, the longer we use it, the thinner the cartilage becomes and there may be areas of damaged cartilage. And that tends to be the actual pain source in arthritis. So interestingly, in Europe, they typically don't say osteoarthritis for, the, for, for this condition. They actually call it chondropathy, or injury or damage to the articular cartilage. Yeah. So oftentimes, is, are you successful in sparing um, a patient from surgery, from replacements, some knee replacements, hip replacements by, by using stem cell procedures? Absolutely we are. And in fact, I think we're going to see, begin to see more and more of this over the next 10 to 15 years. Because as the baby boomers are growing, and it's the pig and the python model where there's a large population coming up into their 50s, 60s, and 70s, they're looking for alternatives besides surgical intervention. And this field of regenerative orthopedics has really blossomed because of its success rate. In fact, what, a, what we typically see both nationally and internationally as a success rate is about 70 to 80 percent. And I, and I should bring up the fact that most of these procedures are not covered by health insurance. And that's correct. Right? So, and now a knee replacement surgery has got to be a fortune, right? It right. can't, depending upon deductibles and all right. of that I mean, stuff. It's tens of thousands of dollars? Yeah, fifty to seventy thousand dollars on and average. Compared to what a, a stem cell for, uh, typically would be how much? Five less? to fifteen thousand dollars depending upon the location in the United States. It would be smart for insurance companies to cover this, right? It absolutely would be smart. And I think, yeah. I think the dominoes are beginning to fall with this too. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some opposition to it because there has, not, there has not been oversight or regulations with this, uh, but the dominoes are beginning to fall. In fact, there's over 700 clinical studies in the United States currently ongoing regarding stem cells. Well, okay, let's, let's kind of break it down. Sure. Let's get back to the PRP, sure. which is the simpler of these procedures. That is correct. Right. Um, 
with PRP, why don't you explain what the steps are? First, you withdraw some blood from the patient. Absolutely. Right. So we, we simply do a normal blood draw like you do if you're going to get your cholesterol checked. Right. We do a normal blood draw. We have to spin that down and isolate and concentrate the platelets. And we do that in a centrifuge at about 3,500 revolutions per minute. And that takes about 15 to 20 minutes just to isolate that one layer. Once you have that one layer, that's your PRP. You want to get rid of everything else except for the concentrated layer of plasma. And what, is, what does that look like? Uh, it actually looks like urine. <laughs> it's kind of yellow. It's a yellowish. yellow color, right. and the number one st right. the number one thing that people say is it literally looks like urine. But uh, but it's uh, a little bit thicker than it than, is than urine would be. It is. Right? It's quite thick actually. Right. So you take that component, which is a plasma, mm -hmm. right, and then you inject it into the. Let's talk about it, the knee, for instance. I've had it done. Yes. Let's talk about. We could talk about my knee. Okay. Okay. Inject it, and you you hook it up to a, you hook you hook your. Uh, um, into a, an ultrasound machine, right? Correct. So you can actually guide the needle to the precise place where it needs to be administered. That's imperative. Yeah. So one of the most imperative things is you have to be in the exact location where you want to be. And so you have to use some sort of image guidance, whether that be live x-ray called fluoroscopy mm -hmm. or a live ultrasound. Because if you don't use that, your success rate goes down tremendously. Right. Okay, so then you find the space. Um, you, I guess, or I should say, you freeze the area typically with some lidocaine first. This Correct. is outpatient. This is, uh, you know, I mean, I, within, within an hour, the whole process. A minute out of your office within an hour, and I walk out and. I'm not going to tell you this, but at the end of the day, I still do exercise. I Me mean, too. I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. totally non-compliant oh. as well. I understand. <laughs> okay. I mean, you probably tell people, take a day off, right? <laughs> I do. Right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay, but I was just trying to make, make the point that um, oftentimes it's, um, you know, it's, you go about your own business the next day. You can go. I, I, I leave your office and go right to work. Absolutely. Yeah. It's quick, it's yeah. simple, and it's relatively pain-free. Okay. So, all right. So now you, you're injecting it, mm -hmm. being aided by an ultrasound or by an x-ray. Correct. And, um, and you're actually just uh, sticking a needle with uh, the plasma into somebody's body part. Right? That's exactly it. And so I'm either injecting it directly into right. a joint or I'm actually direct, or I'm injecting it directly into a tendon, a specific tendon or ligament. Right. And then, what? How long does it take till somebody can really notice a, a difference? So every patient's a little bit right. different, and about twenty-five percent. 25% of patients are a super responder, they'll actually notice a significant difference within three to seven days. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of patients tend to notice differences four to six weeks out. So there was a really good study. There's a gold standard utilized in, in osteoarthritis for knees in the United States where we inject the gel, something called Synvis, Uflexa, one of the products, but it's a hyaluronic acid. It basically lubricates the knee, makes patients feel better for about four to six months, and you have to repeat it, and it's a series of three shots. So there's been two large studies. Both of those were double-blinded, so they're gold standard studies. They're excellent studies. One was from the University of Chicago, the other was in Europe, where we've compared PRP mm -hmm. to hyaluronic acid injections, which is our gold standard of osteoarthritis treatments. PRP on both of those studies has done better for a longer time and had better improvement in general for patients. Oh. So for, I mean, I, and it's kind of strange. I mean, I've had it done a couple times. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, I mean, my knees are, you know, a lifetime of, of working out and they're pretty bad. Um, and, and I've noticed that sometimes I can feel the injection immediately. I mean, I, I can, by the end of the day, feel better. Other times I, I don't kind of notice it and then it creeps up on you in a matter of weeks. There you go. So, and that's actually the, so you have always been one of those really nice responders. You're in that 25% range where patients typically feel significant improvement early on, but it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is actually something called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. And that's a chemical or a cytokine in your body or in your plasma, um, specifically your platelets, that's released when you inject it into a joint or spe uh, a specific body part, and that's an anti-inflammatory. It's basically your body's own cortiso cortisone, but it's long-lasting and it doesn't degrade tissue. You talked earlier about um, the, whatever the term was used for joints that move, mm -hmm. right? So it, all those joints are um, can benefit from PRP. 
Yes. So, so um, shoulder, for instance? Shoulders do beautifully. Not only does the shoulder do well, but the rotator cuff well, mm -hmm. does well. Elbows, it's a gliding articular joint as well. Even the wrist is uh, an articular joint. The right. wrist is an articular joint because all those little bones are covered by cartilage. Mm -hmm. So any major joint in the body, you name it, even down to the base of the thumb called the CMC joint, does very well with PRP. And I know I have, I have friends who have been asking me about hips. Mm -hmm. How about with hips? So hips work beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, I, initially, I started doing these about 10 years ago for a multitude of different issues in the hips, whether it be from a labrum tear in the hip, gluteus medius tendonitis, uh, or actual hip pain itself. And if you catch it early enough with regards to arthritis, that can significantly stave off any major interventions for anywhere between 5 to 15 years, depending upon the patient. Well, wow. Okay, so that's PRP. Mm -hmm. Now, do you typically try PRP before you try stem cell or, or sometimes just go right to the stem cell? It depends. Every patient's yeah. a little bit different. A lot of patients are now educated about this stuff, and they're educated in the regenerative orthopedics and the orthobiologics. So they'll come in and ask me. Um, specifically, they say, hey, I want this particular treatment and this particular um, medical therapy, and I'm perfectly happy to do that. But if you come in and you don't know and you're a good candidate for PRP versus stem cells, I usually want to do PRP first because I'll get you feeling better for about one to three years and then you come back and you can either repeat that or you can go up to stem cells at that point in time. PRP is less expensive than Absolutely. What generally, what's the cost of a PRP? PRP nationally and locally tends to run about $500 per injection. Okay. So much, much less expensive than, and, and you don't have to be uh, anesthetized per se. Not for PRP. for PRP. It's pretty quick and easy, and you said it. Just inject a little bit of lidocaine superficially, right. take the edge off. Right. Okay, and PRP, and we'll talk about this if we have some time. It's also being used cosmetically. We'll get to that. Absolutely, in a it is. Okay, let's talk about stem cell. Where, where do stem cells come from? So stem cells are the building blocks of the body. So you and I started from basically one or two stem cells, and then we right. grew from there. Um, but as we became adults, we have, a, we have a continuing reserve of stem cells. So if we injure ourselves, those stem cells are released, basically, to repair tissue. So we always have stem cells sitting dormant or asleep in our body. Um, that's the main place where stem cells come mm -hmm. from. They, co they are in our body to repair tissue that is damaged or outdated. But there's um, sources outside of our body there is also obtain stem cells, right? There yeah. is. So in the last few years, because of this blossoming field, we've began to extract stem cells from pregnancy uh, or post-pregnancy products, so donors. And there's a variety of different options available to us now. The most common one that you'll typically hear about is cord blood stem cells. Um, oftentimes they're referred to as embryologic stem cells as well. They're not from fetuses. They're not mm -hmm. from babies. They're from a donor that's donated their cord blood and they isolate those pluripotent stem cells, which are actually partly mesenchymal stem cells. Along that same line of thought, during pregnancy, there's a lot of different products, too, that we're beginning to harvest because of their potential to regenerate tissues. So there's something called exosomes, which you may hear out there. Exosomes is where they take the stem cells, they decrease the oxygen level very, very slowly, so the stem cells think that they're dying. So they package up all their really important vital information and they release them so they're actually worth something. So that stem cell just didn't die. It released all of its important vital uh, chemical mm -hmm. signalings. And those are called exosomes because we collect those and then we can inject those. The other thing that's made its way, which has been around for a few years, is something called Wharton's jelly. Wharton's jelly is a combination of stuff. It has stem cells in it, nutrients in it, as well as hyaluronic acid products in it. And of course you have, you could be your own donor. You take stem cells from, from your own body and re-inject them. Now, full disclosure, my daughter mm -hmm. had it done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, with, with her, um, she had an Achilles tendon problem, right? So it was an arthritis. She's a younger, younger girl. And, um, and she did try PRP and had a little bit of relief, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, wasn't lasting. Correct. Right, so, and then you 
suggested the stem cell procedure. And uh, why don't you explain what, in her instance, what you had to do? Because you took her own stem cells. That is correct. Yeah. So whenever I, whenever I have this opportunity to, to offer patients various procedures, uh, whether it be from an, uh, what we call an allograft, meaning the other person's or the donor stem cells, or your own stem cells, I tend to lean on your own stem cells. It is, I've never had a complication in doing this for 10 years. They're your own stem cells. You're not going to reject them. You're not going to have an infection. It's a controlled environment. Um, so I like to use patients' own stem cells to repair tissue. So in your daughter's situation, what we did was, you mentioned it, we did a couple PRP. She got some nice relief, but just wasn't getting over the hump. So what we did with her was we actually did a mini liposuction to harvest adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is exquisitely rich in dormant or hibernating stem cells. So you do a mini liposuction. Okay, so, 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 let me stop mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Okay. So you, you kind of give her uh, some anesthesia. Absolutely. But, but she wasn't, wasn't asleep, right? She's totally awake, mm -hmm. right? And, when you, and then you... Why don't you talk about specifically what you did? Sure, absolutely. Okay. So I, I like to make things comfortable. I, okay. I don't know about you. I don't like getting things done on myself. Right. So whenever I have something done, I want it to be comfortable. So we'll place an IV to right. give IV medications, whether it's for sed or fentanyl or a combination right. of both. So it's just almost the same drug you get for like a colonoscopy. Right? It's exactly the same medication. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we give IV antibiotics mm -hmm. to reduce the uh, potential of infections. Right. So once you're asleep and you're comfortable or you're awake and you're comfortable, then we just do two very small incisions less than one centimeter on either side of the abdomen and do a mini liposuction, which takes about 45 minutes to an hour to perform. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you get requests for more a than A little extra. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the number one request. Yeah. <laughs> Um, once you have that adipose tissue, you can microfragment it and break it up so all of the tissue that you don't want is you can take away mm -hmm. and you only save the tissue that you want, just the adipocytes or the fat cells. So this goes into the same a, a similar uh, centrifuge machine to be... This one's a little bit different because of the FDA compliance. So mm -hmm. I'm very FDA compliant with this whole regulatory affairs that has currently uh, been changed as of 2017. You have to minimally manipulate these cells. And in order to do that, what I utilize is a device out of Milan, Italy, that microfragments it or breaks it up into little tiny pieces and only takes away just the adipose tissue with the stem cells sitting on the adipose tissue. So I cleanse it with an IV bag, two, one to two IV bags, so it's completely clean. And then you break it apart and save just the fat cells with the stem cells sitting on them. Right. And then the, sim and the process is similar to what you do with the PRP through guided imagery. You then inject into the body part uh, in a specific spot. Absolutely. And with your yeah. daughter's case, there was a specific location, too. So I, I was very familiar with your daughter's Achilles mm -hmm. tendon. And there was one very specific uh, location that showed up both on our physical exam as well as the ultrasound. That was the area of damaged tissue. And so what, you, what I did with her is I went directly into that area and inject stem cells in combination with PRP into that one area. Had not we had the ability to do stem cell, what would have been the solution for my daughter? Oh, long and arduous, to be perfectly honest with you. The Achilles is notoriously a slow healing tendon. Mm -hmm. um, you can put patients in a boot. You can, uh, some people will actually inject cortisone, which I highly recommend against because of the potential of rupture in large tendons. Um, therapy or physical therapy is one option. It probably would have been a six to 12 month uh, regimen of relatively conservative things. Um, and, and by the way, she had done all those things. She unsu had. And been unsuccessful. She had, Fire, yeah. she had. And the, the other step is you can go to surgery where you clean it out. There's an open surgery and mm -hmm. there's a closed surgery called a percutaneous tenotomy as well. But both of those would have been much more invasive and a much longer healing and recovery time. Mm -hmm. And she's doing great. I just have to tell you, doing great. Thank Unbe you. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I mentioned that there's other uses now for PRP. You go mm -hmm. into a dermatology office or a cosmetic surgeon and everybody's offering these uh, microneedling, uh, PRP, now they're using it for hair transplants, Absolutely. right? It works in so many different places. Oh, it yeah. does. So, so it's amazing. So 
orthopedics and sports medicine really kind of started the PRP movement in the United States and, and now the stem cell movement in the United States. Um, and then it started trickling down to the cosmetic aspects because mm -hmm. of the regenerative properties of PRP. Neovascularizations, which is growing new blood vessels in there. But the big thing that you want with skin is color and collagen. So it improves hyperpigmentation from the sun, those little dark spots that we all get right. from the sun, as well as improves collagen. And collagen is the stuff that makes you, that makes your skin bounce tight. back and look <laughs> tight and nice. Right, yeah, yeah. And so we're injecting PRP now mm -hmm. and utilizing PRP for multiple different locations in cosmetic medicine. The next field on that is gonna be stem cells. Mm -hmm. So, it, so it, the way it helps cartilage, it also helps build collagen. Absolutely, and the, the, way that, the way that I look at that is uh -huh. the platelet and the platelets in our bodies are our first line of defense in any sort of injury. Their job is to start and begin and initiate the regeneration of healthy tissue. Right. So microneedling is what exactly? Microneedling is basically injecting PRP, whether it be in the face, chest, hands we do, but it's injecting it into the dermis, just shallow, very shallow, mm -hmm. not deep, injecting it into the dermis to stimulate regeneration of healthy tissue. And the results are pretty impressive. How long does it last, when, cosmetically? It can last upwards of one to five years, depending upon the patient. Well, yeah, it, it also, really works. And also it saves surgery, Absolutely. facelifts, uh, and all these other procedures that, that so is this a positive thing or a negative thing for doctors? <laughs> uh, so it, it, goes, it goes either way, whichever yeah. way you look. But I think in general, it's, a, it's more of a positive thing for patients because ne we don't necessarily sure. need to get these yeah. big facelifts anymore. We can just do microneedling and inject PRP and uh -huh. we're even making gels out of PRP um, where we inject to f as an actual filler too. So if you heat up the PRP right. to just a super physiologic temperature, just a little bit above mm -hmm. of what we are, about 100 to 104 degrees, and it'll create a gel and so that gel is actually a filler for something like the nasolabial folds the crow's feet etc yeah. yeah and it lasts long because it's regenerating healthy tissue just like it is in orthopedic and spine medicine an orthopedic uh, PRP any uh, side effects adverse reactions people should be aware of I've done a, I, so I've done about 30 to 40,000 of these. I've had three of them. All of them happen to be on physicians. Uh, it's the physician's <laughs> curse, as we all call it. Yeah. It's just a massive inflammatory response, uh -huh. uh, and it sticks around for a while, and there's not much you can do with it, um, but it's not dangerous, and it does subside. And, and then the PRP will work after that? And it will work after that, but it, it takes a long time if you are an unfortunate patient with that. But again, I've done 30 or 40,000 of these, and I've had three incidences of it. Uh, for more information, you can give Dr. Matt Otten a call. Thank hey, you. Thank you so much, Matt. My pleasure. Thank you. Dana fought a long battle with Crohn's disease before passing last year. Max has spent a lifetime scoring goals. It's our goal to help the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation find a cure for this horrible disease so no one else's child has to suffer like Dana did. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis may be unfamiliar to you, but there are currently over three million Americans suffering from both. Join Max and I in scoring our goal to find a cure.